welcome to Beyond Reproach. This is Stephanie Domingo. This is Tux Lurzel. We be drinking and we be swearing. Mm-hmm. We come to you from Bushwick, Brooklyn, where we record on land belonging to the Lenape Nation, a nation that is one of many still very much out here doing its thing, and we'd like to acknowledge that. This is the show about scandals and scandalousness in American politics and government. Yes. Yes, it is. Welcome. Welcome to the, the Halloween edition, one, uh, one of two, October. It's so spooky. It is spooky. <laughs> it's chilling. This cocktail is is very spooky. It mm-hmm. looks like it's like illuminated in a it very does, creepy right? way. Yeah. It's sort of this like ghostly green, sort yeah. of pale green color with a like black maraschino cherry on top. It's a little creepy, but <laughs> I'm, I'm into it. I love it. You're a Halloween person, right? <sighs> um, I haven't actually like dressed up and like done things for Halloween in a long time. Yeah. But I do enjoy Halloween. And I, I use, when I did used to dress up, I lived for it. Yeah. Russell doesn't really care for it. So that's why I haven't really bothered in a long time. Cause I'm like, where am I going to go if Russell's not, you know, I like dressing up, but you like the spooky. Oh, well, I mean, you like I love that Halloween there's, movies. Yes. I love yeah. that there's ho- horror movies on all month long oh, in October. Hate, oh. It's the best. Yeah. You and Tim love. Oh yeah. Tim and uh, Tim's wife, Christine, and I always get together in October and watch scary movies together. Yeah, I am never there because I am a baby. Yes. Last year when we did it, we watched this really stupid movie. Oh, yeah. You said that it was not scary at all and that I could have totally came over yeah, and watched absolutely. it. Yeah, absolutely. You should have yeah. been there. I, you sent me clips of it and it was like the special effects are in air quotes. Ridiculous. Because, I mean, it's so bad. I can't remember what it was called. It was like a sci-fi alien thing where People these... People were being possessed, right? Yeah, the, the astronauts went to to space and they found this like colony and then they brought these humanoid beings back to earth with them and like all hell breaks loose and they they're like sucking people's souls out of their bodies yeah oh my god it was so bad we were we were (laughs) dying laughing the entire time we'll put it on the show notes if i can think of it terrible Halloween sci-fi alien movie alien yeah. it was like space vampires essentially yeah I think you sent me life force oh yes it was called life force, life force. it's literally it's like a, a very thinly veiled like vampire movie but okay. like they're aliens but they're vampires okay and instead of like biting you they just suck your soul out through your mouth and then like the people would turn into these like old shriveled like dust people <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> okay yeah it sounds terrible yeah it was real bad. I like those ones too, though. Like, I do oh, love a scary, love like a legitimate scary movie, yeah. but I almost like the bad ones better. But is anything really scary to you? Sure. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, shit. Damn. I genuinely prefer the ones that are just sort of like Silly. laughable and campy. And yeah. Yeah. But I love, especially like old horror movies. I love 80s horror movies. Poltergeist is like one of my favorite movies yeah. in the world ever. Like, Have you just... ever gotten to like Japanese movies? Or yes, Korean? They... Korean. I hear... Korean like zombie movies. I hear are... they will like fuck you up for life. Yeah. They're so scary. I <laughs> watched, uh, was set on a train, train to boot. Busan. Oh my god, it's so gory and graphic and like incredible. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so good. Just yeah, but they have like a whole <laughs> Korean zombie yeah. flick like genre now that's like they put American zombie movies to shame. I believe it because Koreans they do everything like so good. Like yeah. that's why I'm obsessed. I I had like a substance abuse problem with K dramas. <laughs> like it was all I thought about. It was all I wanted to watch for like months in 2018. I like lost myself. Like Jessica, my older sister, she, I thought I was in a safe space and I confessed to her that like I was living all the entirety of my life for K dramas. So she would just text me randomly like on a Wednesday. She's like, Are you watching a K drama? Every time I was. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I was yes, I like, am. you don't know my life. But actually <laughs> but you do. I am. <laughs> Damn it. So yeah, I understand that they can get you. Yeah, they're real good. But I love all the like classics too. I love Jaws. I love Alien. Yeah. And Aliens and <laughs> and Nightmare on Elm Street. Like The Exorcist. Yes. Another one that's like very well done and like that shit was stands real up today. Scary. Yeah, but let's let's get into this cocktail. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> totally derailed. <laughs> uh. So today we are drinking a cocktail from the 1920s called a Last Word. So this is a Prohibition era cocktail. Obviously, we've already done quite a few Prohibition era cocktails on the show. Some of the really big, like popular ones. In the 20s, obviously, the Bee's Knees is probably one of the most famous Prohibition-era cocktails that people think of. The Gin Ricky, 
uh, highball, Jack Rose, sidecar, the old fashioned. We've done all of these, not necessarily all as 1920s cocktails, but they all were popular in the 20s. But today I needed to dig a little bit deeper to find something like that we haven't done before. And thankfully, I found the last word. My story takes place in the Midwest, and this cocktail was invented in Detroit. Oh, yes. Okay. It was first served at the, the Motor Detroit. City. Yeah, it was first served at the Detroit Athletic Club in 1915. Uh, you had to be a club member to be able to get into the club to taste it. Okay. But it did eventually spread around the Midwest. It gained some popularity during Prohibition. And the base spirit in it is gin. And we all obviously loved ourselves some gin in the 1920s. After Prohibition, it kind of faded away in popularity over the years. But it did appear in print in Ted Saucier's 1951 book, Bottoms Up. And oddly enough, in 1951, that was the first time the recipe was ever printed, written down and printed in a book in the 50s. Wow. Yeah. But even after that, that didn't really help its popularity come back at all. It still basically just faded away from memory almost completely until the early 2000s when a bartender at Seattle's Zigzag Cafe found Saucier's book and put the last word on the menu at the Zigzag Cafe. And it blew up because this was during, in the early 2000s, you yeah. will remember, the, the, cocktail. The, the Prohibition era cocktail yes. revival. Yes, he was wearing suspenders. Yes, he had, he had a mustache. in his mustache. Uh-huh. Yeah. It was a Luke. A Luke, yes. This is now like a staple in high-end cocktail lounges, especially in the early 2000s, but it's still around today. People are still making this. Probably more popular now than it actually was in the 20s, to I be honest. That, yeah. yeah, It's um, a really cool looking cocktail. Yeah. It's made with London dry gin, maraschino liqueur, fresh mm-hmm. lime juice, and green chartreuse. Green chartreuse is a bright green, sweet, syrupy, spicy, herbal, minty liqueur from France. The color, the green of France. green... Ch- yes, France. <laughs> <laughs> the color green is... natural in green chartreuse. It comes from the blend of 130 herbs and botanicals that's used to make it. What? It is made in small batches by monks in France. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. It's pretty expensive, green chartreuse. Wow. Um, But if you can find small bottles, a little goes a long way. So if you can find a small bottle, you don't need a ton of it to make this drink. So get the small bottle if you can, because it's pricey otherwise. Even the small bottle is like, I'm paying 30 bucks for this little Really? Bottle. Yeah. But you'll have it for the rest of your life. Yeah, exactly. So should we take a taste? Yeah. We first it's have such to a cool ch- color. Cheers. Yeah. yeah. It looks lit from within. Yeah. Like there's a black light shining on it yeah, or something, right? Totally. Cheers. And cheers. When I was a kid at school, learning the golden rule, teacher often used to say, if you don't tell a lie, there's not a reason why you can't be like Washington someday. How could Washington be a married man and never, never tell a lie? <laughs> Ooh, it's mm. very complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I taste the herbal. It's kind of sweet. Yeah. Not super sweet. It's more like tart. From the lime juice. Mm-hmm. There's that maraschino liqueur in there too. It but it's got a little, little bit of like um, an anise flavor. I was just about to say. It tastes like the fennel kind of licorice, black mm-hmm. licorice. Yeah, that's, that's like the, the biggest flavor that I'm getting. Yeah, that's from the chartreuse. But then you get that like juniper from the gin a little bit mm. too. Yeah, it's very complex. Oh, it's, it's delicious, so nice. right? Oh, I get why this is popular. Yeah, totally. It's also, it's quite strong. So Uh-oh. it's a cocktail that's meant for sort of slip, sipping and savoring slowly rather than just like slinging it back. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> Don't tell me how to drink my drink. <laughs> because this is a Prohibition era cocktail, if you look online, a lot of people claim that this would have originally been made with bathtub gin and that it was all these complex flavors were added to it to cover up the flavor. To cover up the flavor, okay. But it was invented in 1915, five years before Prohibition started. So calm the fuck down. No, no, no. It seems like there's a lot of... Hot takery? Yeah, it's more fact than fiction. There's a lot of legend that comes along with this cocktail. More fiction than fact. That's what I said, Stephanie. Oh, (laughs) I'm stupid. Yes. (laughs) Yes, more fiction than fact. Thank you. (laughs) 
there's also a lot of articles if you especially like if you go online and you're looking like what cocktails were popular in a certain era there's always these sort of like lists of drinks yeah that are like this was huge in the 1920s but in reality if you actually start looking into the history of these cocktails this probably didn't spread very far outside of the midwest it's on several lists of cocktails from prohibition that were like lead you to believe that everyone was drinking this in Prohibition. It was regional. Uh, it was, I think it was very regional. Yeah. A, because it was originally invented at this private club in Detroit. Yeah. And it never appeared in print until, until 1950. Like, yeah, 1951. What? So if it was huge in the 1920s, it would somebody... Be everywhere. Exactly, yeah. But also, because it's flavored with two very specific European spirits... That would have been really hard to come by during Prohibition unless you either, A, had it stored up, you know, that you bought before the Volstead Act. And why would you have yeah. this, like, rare made-by-monks? Like, yeah, unless you knew that you were going to be making – like, the Detroit Athletic Club probably had some yeah, on stops. hand somewhere. Yeah. Or maybe you knew a good smuggler. But most people – like, this wasn't something bootleggers could replicate, these flavors no. of green chartreuse and maraschino no. liqueur. So – I don't think it was nearly as popular as as you're led to believe, but it was popular to some extent during the 1920s. So I still think it holds up for today. Most of the recipes that you will find if you look online call for all the ingredients to be mixed in equal parts. One part gin, one part lime juice, maraschino, and chartreuse all in equal amounts. But wow. that seems very unusual yeah. to me. So chartreuse is I, like sounds so it, it's, so strong. Like it's the flavor. strong, strongly flavored and sweet. And the arachino liqueur is also so very sweet. sweet. So I was like, that doesn't quite sound right. And like knowing enough about cocktails, I'm like, usually the base spirit is in higher amounts than yeah. anything else. So I kind of was like doing a little digging. I've kept finding multiple recipes that said equal parts of everything. But then I found this comment from someone on one of the posts that said his grandfather used to work at the Detroit Athletic Club. And they did two parts gin to one part everything else originally. That makes sense. Which is like, that makes so much more yeah, sense. That Th- sounds like it would taste good and not yeah. be like so sweet. Yeah. So I looked and then like there were all these sub comments that were like, oh my God, I tried your recipe and it's so much better like than the one that they told you to make. So I actually tried both versions. The one part, one part, one part is so sweet. It's good. It tastes good, but it's way sweeter than this. And adding extra gin doesn't make it feel extra boozy. It just feels lighter. It's like much more refreshing and less sweet. Yeah. So that's what we're doing today. So cheers. Cheers. That yeah. was delicious. It's, all right. I'm going to take another sip, loosen my jaw gums. That's what makes for a great show, I hear. Okay. This is Halloween month. It's October. So I decided I wanted to do, along with this spooky fluorescent green cocktail... I also wanted to do a story that felt appropriate for the month of October. I wouldn't quite call it... It's not a ghost story, and I wouldn't quite call it a monster story, but the man I'm going to be talking about today is a fucking monster. My scandal is also a monster story, I guess. In 1925, David Curtis Stevenson was the most powerful man in Indiana. He was a kingmaker who had countless politicians in his pocket, and the source of his power was the rapid growth of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, no. From his luxurious yacht on Lake Erie, he entertained senators, congressmen, judges, governors, and several state legislators. But if you crossed him, he could send a mob of hooded Klansmen marching to your door. With the dial of a phone, he could have a man beaten up or make him disappear. Wow. He also loved to treat beautiful women like his disposable playthings and ruined their lives without a second thought. And he always got away with it until he didn't. Yay! Yes. (laughs) On uh, in come up in (laughs) yes in November 1925, D.C. Stevenson was on trial for rape and murder, and the chief witness against him was the victim herself, or at least her deathbed statement against him. Oh no! So today, I would like to propose a toast. Raise a glass. Yes. To flush and turds. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. I love it. Sometimes life is filled with pieces of shit. But if you're lucky, they'll get what's coming to them. Ain't that the truth. I will drink to that every day. Yes. D.C. Stevenson was not always rich and powerful. 
He was born the son of a Texas sharecropper, and he only made it to the eighth grade. But later in life, if you asked him, he would tell you that his father was a wealthy businessman from South Bend. Oh! Who paid for his college education. St- yes. Okay. During World War I, he spent most of his time at a recruiting office in Iowa, but he would tell his powerful friends that he was decorated for his battlefield heroics while he was fighting the Germans in France. He had bone spurts. Yes. <laughs> he would have went, but yeah. he had bone spurts. <laughs> So we know that this man was a fucking liar. Yeah, he was a con. Yes. But wait, there's oh, more. Oh, God. He was also a drifter and a drunk who had several run-ins with the law in the late 1910s and early 1920s. He was also an abusive womanizer who was twice divorced by 1922. He abandoned his first wife while she was pregnant. Ugh. And she had to hunt him down to serve him with the divorce papers. Wow, what a what a loser. Yes. What a violent piece of shit loser. Yes. And what a actually what a turd. Yeah, he was a turd, yes. I, I don't I don't identify with that word. It feels very juvenile, but it fits. He was more a piece of shit than a turd, <laughs> oh, that, to be honest. Yeah, piece of shit is another it's just so graphic, but I that's the point. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So his second wife divorced him for beating her so often. Ugh. Yes. But despite all of his failings, he was certain that he was destined for greater things. I'm a nobody from nowhere, really, but I've got the biggest brains. Ah! I'm going to be the biggest man in the United States. Oh, what it a- sounds like someone I know. I can't yeah, put my I, finger on that, it. <laughs> that, sound, oh, that delusion hmm. sounds so familiar. Yes. Like- <laughs> so in 1921, he joined the Ku Klux Klan. He would later claim that they had begged him to join. Of course. Yes. Of course. They'd be nothing without him. Uh-huh. But either way, his rise to power within the clan was meteoric. His days as an army recruiter must have helped him quite a bit because early on he was put in charge of recruiting new members to the clan. And in the 1920s, clan membership was growing in the Midwest faster oh, than yeah. anywhere else in the country. Yeah. This was during was the Klan's heyday. second wave. Yeah. Yes. They were expanding out of the South, and Midwestern Protestants, who feared and hated foreigners and Catholics just as much as they hated black people, were joining their ranks in droves. Mm-hmm. From the summer of 1922 to the summer of 1923, 2,000 new members were joining the Ku Klux Klan in Indiana alone each and every week. 2,000 new members a week Didn't know in the Indiana state of Indiana. Had that many people. Yes. Within a few years, almost one third of the white men in the entire state were Klan members. Oh, wow. That explains a lot. Yes. And Stevenson was such a success as a recruiting officer during this time that he eventually was put in charge of recruiting for seven other states north of Mississippi. The South had had their time. Yeah. This was the Midwest's time to time. shine. Yes. And recruiting agents were given a portion of the fees that were paid by new members. So D.C. Stevenson became very, very rich very quickly. Mm. Stupid rich. At first, the national head of the KKK, imperial wizard Hiram Evans, loved D.C. Stevenson, loved him, and he promoted him to the Grand Wizard of Indiana. These names are so stupid. They're so stupid. Like, are you guys playing Dungeons and Dragons? Seriously. Like, what? You're a wizard? You're a grand wizard? Yes. Like, do you have a costume? (sighs) They, I mean, I yes. mean, they did have a costume. <laughs> yes, but they like, did. But their costumes are all the fucking same. Well, like, I half, think the higher ranking like, you are, there was like purple like a, ones like and stuff. Like a crown or yeah. something like decorative <laughs> or like some jewels. Yeah. You know, just jewels. Just, just don't forget thought. these are straight white men. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. But it, yeah, anyway, so his love for Stevenson didn't last. The problem was the KKK hated drunkenness and impropriety. <sighs> It's so stupid, but the KKK saw themselves as these, like, moral, law-abiding people. The disconnect is mind-blowing. Yeah. Like, you're you're these moral, Christian, like, law-abiding white people, but then you're going and, like... Everyone's the hero of their own story. Exactly, yes. If you remember the Ma and Pa Ferguson story that we did, I think it was episode, like, 18, I want to say, maybe. But they were, like, fighting... The KKK, yeah. Ma and Pa Ferguson. Not because they were anti-racist. No. But because they were pro-booze. Yes. And the KKK was super, super 
against alcohol and was all for prohibition. Yeah, and they were against the people who are consuming alcohol. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a big part of it too. That yeah. like the Catholics especially yes. like Stevenson loved to drink. Uh-oh. And rumors about his drinking were starting to make their way up the ranks. Over and over and over, Evans was getting these reports about r- rowdy brawls and attempted rapes and inappropriate sexual encounters, and all of them almost always had to do with Stevenson being drunk, like drunk. One woman told police that he had attempted to have sex with her while she was in his car and said that he is, quote, is a beast when he is drunk. In Ohio, he pled guilty to indecent exposure when the sheriff caught him with his pants down next to a young woman parked in his Cadillac on the side of the highway. In January 1924, a manicurist was sent to his hotel room And he tried to force himself on her. She tried to escape. And he ended up punching out a bellboy who tried to come to her rescue. Wow. Yes. That fall, a young actress who was attending a party at Stevenson's home told investigators that he had locked her in a room, knocked her down, bit her, and tried to force himself on her. Wow. So by the summer of 1924... Hiram Evans called D.C. Stevenson before a Klan tribunal on charges including habitual drunkenness and, quote, demonstrating disrespect for virtuous womanhood. Okay. Yes. You know. Virtuous. Uh Uh Mm -hmm. Okay. He was found guilty on six charges. And the KKK said that he should be banished from the KKK by his local sort of chapter. Was he? No. I'm like, they don't. Care. Nope. He's white. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when he got back to Indiana, he basically just told the leadership in Indiana that, like, the old Southern clan was trying to, was, like, out to get out him. Out to get him, of yes. course. Because he hated this Hiram Evans guy. So he agreed, though, to try and keep a low profile to sort of stay off Hiram Evans' radar. So he stepped back from recruiting and instead decided he was going to focus on getting Klan-backed Republican candidates elected to positions across the state. That fall, the Klan swept the 1924 elections, gaining both a majority in both chambers of the Indiana legislature and taking the governor's mansion. Okay. The new governor, Ed Jackson, won by more than 125,000 votes. Shit. Yeah. At Jackson's inauguration party in January of 1925, Stevenson was seated at the same table as 28-year-old Madge Olberholzer. She lived with her parents in Indianapolis and managed a state-run literacy program called the Indiana Young People's Reading Circle. Stevenson introduced himself and asked her to dance, and a few months later, she would describe that evening from her deathbed. Just in a few months? Yes. After the banquet, he asked me for a date several times, but I gave him no definite answer. He later insisted that I take dinner with him at the Washington Hotel, and I consented, and after he came for me at my home in his Cadillac car, and on this occasion we dined together. After that, he called me several times on the phone, and once again I had dinner with him at the Washington Hotel. So just a few, a Is this little from her like diary or something. No, she gave. She ended up statement. giving like a statement on okay. in, from her deathbed. <clears throat> so a, a couple of months pass. We're talking January to March. On March 15th, she had gone out with a friend of hers, and she came home around 10 p.m. When she got home, her mother told her that she had gotten a message from Stevenson's secretary who called saying that he was going to Chicago and he needed to talk to her immediately, that it was, like, super important. Okay. She called him up. She changed into a black velvet dress and a coat, and one of Stevenson's bodyguards picked her up. Eight hours later, her mother was on the phone with a lawyer frantic that Madge had never come home. Two days later, a car pulled up, and a man carried Madge from outside of the car, carried her inside, and put her in bed, telling everyone that she had been in a car accident. What? The family doctor was called, and he rushed over. And the doctor later testified, she was in a state of shock. Her body was cold. Madge told him that she didn't expect or want to get better, that she just wanted to die. Damn. So things are about to get a little intense, so I think this is a good time for us to take a little break, yeah. fix ourselves another drink. I gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> Cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. 
So have you ever thought about what would happen if your airline window popped out? Or if you can build a jetpack using only machine guns. Well, we found out you could, but you really shouldn't. Hi, I'm Jill Chacha. And I'm Marissa Riley. Together, we have one comedy science show called, well, that's interesting. It's for folks who like to learn about weird stuff, like how hair can grow between your teeth and what happens if the moon disappears. If you need a break from the world or need interesting stuff to bring up at a party when those happen again, come on by. Find Well That's Interesting wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Oh, this drink is really good. I know, but I'm scared. I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and drink as much as I want. This is going to be my monkey gland. (laughs) Everyone needs a monkey gland. Yes. Okay, so we're back. Yes. uh, With fresh last words. So Madge is in her bed. The doctor's there and things are really not looking good. She's in her bed suicidal yeah exactly and like in in a really bad state the man who brought her in told everyone that it was a car accident but it is very clear that it had nothing to do with the car accident so the family doctor told her family that she was probably not going to recover from this so on finding out that their daughter was likely dying they asked the family lawyer to come over and take down every word of her story She told the lawyer that when she got to Stevenson's house that night on March 15th, that she was immediately worried walking in the door because there were no other women around. She was home alone with Stevenson, only him and his two bodyguards, Earl Clink and Earl Gentry, and that Stevenson was drunker than she had ever seen him before. Oh, no. And he tried to tell her that she needed to have a drink with him, too, and she refused. Uh Uh-oh. I said I wanted no drink, but Stevenson and the others forced me. I was afraid not to do so, and I drank three small glasses. This made me very ill and dazed, and I vomited. So then Stevenson tells her that he is going to Chicago, him and his friends, and she has to come along with them. What? Yeah. She was like, no, no no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes. I'm actually going to go home where it's safe. Yes, exactly. I remember saying I could not and would not. I was very much terrified and did not know what to do. I said to him that I wanted to go home. Uh Uh-oh. No, you cannot go home. Oh, yes, you are going with me to Chicago. I tried to call my home on the phone but could get no answer. They all took me to the automobile at the rear of Stevenson's yard and we started the trip. I begged of them to drive me past my home so I could get my hat. And once inside my home, I thought that I would be safe from them. But instead, they drove straight to Union Station and bought tickets for the first train to Chicago. But her hat. Yes. That's fucked up. So I'm going to warn everyone here that what happens next gets kind of graphic. So if you're not prepared, you might want to skip forward a minute or two. Trying to prepare myself. Yes. So once they were on the train, uh, Stevenson and one of his bodyguards put Madge into the lower bunk in their private sleeping car. Stevenson took hold of the bottom of my dress and pulled it up over my head. I tried to fight, but was weak and unsteady. Stevenson took hold of my two hands and held them. I had not the strength to move. So Madge said that D.C. Stevenson held her down and took off her clothes and raped her. Mm. But her nightmare was just beginning. He chewed me all over my body, bit my neck and face, chewing my tongue, chewed my breasts until they bled, my back, my legs, my ankles, and mutilated me all over my body. What? Yes. Oh my God. I remember I heard a buzz early in the morning and the porter calling us to get up for Hammond, and Gentry shook me and said that it was time to get up, that we were getting off at Hammond. At this time, I was becoming more conscious, and Stevenson was flourishing his revolver. I said to him to shoot me. He held the revolver against my side, but I did not flinch. I said to him again to kill me, but he put the gun in his grip. (sighs) At this point, she yelled at Stevenson, telling him that the law would come for him. And he said, I am the law in Indiana. (sighs) (sighs) They never made it to Chicago. They got off in Hammond, Indiana, and they went straight to a hotel. They forced Madge to say that she was his wife so that they could stay in the same room together. Stevenson ordered a big breakfast, ate the whole thing, and laid down on the bed and fell asleep. And Madge 
at this point knew that she needed to act like she was cooperating so that she could try and come up with a plan. So she could survive yes. the night. Yes. So she lay down on the bed and tried to think of what she should do next. Eventually, once she knew that he was asleep, she reached into his pocket and slowly pulled out his revolver, being very careful not to wake him. She took aim and aimed right between his eyes. But suddenly she thought that if she were to commit murder, that it would bring shame on her family. So that it would be better if she killed herself instead. She crept into an adjoining room and faced a full length mirror. She didn't think about shooting him in the dick? (laughs) He survived. I mean, she, yes. And I think everyone would kind of understand. And be better for it. The world would be a better place. (laughs) Oh, this story sucks. I know. So she crept into an adjoining room and faced a full length mirror. She could see through her dress that she was covered in blood and wounds. Oh my God. There were bite marks across her face, her neck, her breasts, her back, her legs and ankles. What a psychopath. She was bleeding from her mouth because he had chewed her tongue. And just as she was lifting the gun to her temple, she heard a step outside the door and the knob was starting to turn. So she hid the gun in the folds of her dress, stepped out of the room went back to bed, and slowly slipped the gun back into Stevenson's pocket. She had to think of something else. So after a bit of time, she decided to ask them if she could have some money to go buy a hat and some makeup at a nearby drugstore. In the drugstore, she instead bought a box of bichloride mercury tablets. In the days before antibiotics, bichloride mercury was a topical treatment that was used to treat external infections like syphilis. Okay. It was also sometimes used as a pesticide, And some women knew that you could use it to induce miscarriages at a time before abortion was legal. Okay. But she probably thought to buy it because recently a silent film actress named Olive Thomas had used it to commit suicide. And it was in all the papers. Okay. She slipped the box into her coat pocket so the bodyguards wouldn't see it. Hmm. Went back to the hotel and laid out 18 tablets. She wanted to take them all, but was only able to get down six of them. She said, because they burnt me so. Oh, because of all the blood in her mouth? But I think just the tablets were so caustic. Like, it was not meant to be taken internally. Yeah. Okay. When the men woke up, they found her sick, delirious, and vomiting blood on the floor. And they panicked. He told her that she would have to get her stomach pumped but he would only take her to the hospital if she agreed to check in as his wife. She refused. The night but even bef- if she would check in at his wife, as his wife, she has bites all over her exactly. body. Exactly. Like, like it's, it's like, cool. Wait, your She's husband- my wife. I bit her and that's my right because I'm a white man in the Midwest. Indiana, yeah. God, yeah. That's in 1925. So dark. So the night before, Stevenson's driver had driven his Cadillac up to the hotel in Hammond. So since she refused to check in as his wife, instead, they just forced her into the back of the Cadillac and headed back to Indianapolis. All the way back to Indianapolis, I suffered great pain and agony and screamed for a doctor. I said I wanted a hypodermic to ease the pain, but they refused to stop. I begged and said to Stevenson to leave me along the road someplace, that someone would stop and take care of me if he wouldn't. Yeah. But they just ignored her and sat in the back of the car and just got drunk instead. Wow. Once they made their way back to Indianapolis, they found Madge's mother was waiting outside Stevenson's home. But when they got there, they kind of just covered her up and told the mom that they didn't know what happened to her or where she went. What? Yeah. So the mom left. And once she was gone, they carried her up to the room above the garage in Stevenson's, in the back of Stevenson's property. (sighs) The next day, she seemed to be a little bit better. She wasn't throwing up anymore. So finally, they're like, okay, let's take her home. But she still looks like she's been bitten all over. Yes. And like, she just injected six bichloride mercury tablets. Like, she's not doing well. Yeah. So they agreed to take her home, but only after warning her multiple times to say that she had been in a car accident. Stevenson told her, I am the law and the power. But who... The car bit me like yeah, this? Yeah, exactly, exactly. What? Yeah. So finally, as I said before, they they brought her home. One of the bodyguards lifted her up and carried her and put her in bed, said that she was in a car accident. If she was a car accident, why didn't they take her to the hospital? Exactly. So finally, she's home in bed. The family doctor comes, and he tried to treat her, but by this point, there really wasn't much he could do. He tried to pump her stomach, but by this point, it was already too late. It had been 24 hours since she took those oh, tablets. Yeah. 
Uh, and the doctor later testified that the wounds all over her body appeared to have been made by human teeth. Not not tires? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You don't have those teeth tires? <laughs> yeah, those tire bites? <laughs> yeah. A week or so later, when it became clear that she was not getting better and she was probably going to die, the family called their lawyer over to take down every word of her story, and the lawyer took it to the Marion County prosecutor. Two weeks later, on the morning of April 14th, 1925, Madge Oberholzer died with her parents and a nurse by her side. Wow. She's what, like 29? 28, 20, yeah. 28, yeah. wow. On paper, the official cause of death was mercury poisoning. But during the trial, the doctor testified that the bites on her breast had become infected mm. and the infection had spread to her lungs and her kidneys. Okay. He but also, she only took the mercury because she was, it was her only way out in her exactly. mind. And she had been raped and saw that yeah. as something shameful for a woman at that point in history, you know? Yeah. And just wanted, thought that was the only way out. Yeah, yeah, she was traumatized. Exactly. So the doctor also testified that she probably would have lived if she had gotten medical attention Oh, earlier. of course. Yes. Stevenson, Clink, and Gentry were all arrested, and Stevenson was charged with rape, kidnapping, conspiracy, and second-degree murder. Stevenson versus State was a landmark case. Good. Not just because it was about murder charges being brought up against a grand dragon of the KKK, but also because we were talking about murder as a crime of omission rather than commission. Oh, okay. So the trial was a circus. Yeah. Newspaper reporters came from all over the country to sort of witness what was happening. Yeah. 260 potential jurors were interviewed in the selection process. To get down to 12, 260 jurors. And Stevenson's lawyers tried and failed to keep Madge's deathbed statements from being admitted as evidence during the trial. Throughout the whole thing, Stevenson remained calm, cool, and collected. He literally was just a cucumber sitting there like, everything's good. I got this. Wow. Because he was certain that Governor he Jackson... He a piece of shit. Oh, he was he literally... Is a- a rapist, monster, piece of shit. He was certain that Governor Jackson was going to pardon him. Oh! Wh- he never <laughs> even he never even testified in, on his own behalf. Because what could he say? Yeah. He would tell reporters... The car did it? Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> when asked, uh, he told reporters that this whole thing was just a political move to discredit him. Oh! And his lawyers would say the same thing, claiming in court that Southern Klan forces loyal to Hiram Evans were trying to set him up. So they came up from the South to rape and bite her and leave Blame it on her him. in his care. And have his bodyguard carry her home. So, <laughs> the logic. Uh huh. So the lawyers also in court questioned whether Stevenson should be held responsible for somebody else's suicide. Yes. If this so-called dying declaration declares anything, it is a dying declaration of suicide, not homicide. Has everybody lost his head? Pray, are we all insane? Wow. Yes. Wow. That's like she's just committing suicide to commit because it's like the just to make him look bad. Yeah. (laughs) The ego. I mean, he garbage, garbage defense. But he thought the governor's going to pardon him. The governor, like he paid for that governor to be governor, so. Why yeah. wouldn't he be, be pardoned? The doctor who performed the autopsy testified, quote, The immediate cause of death was an infection carried through the bloodstream, localizing in the lung and in the kidney. He went on to say that if it hadn't been for those bite wounds, she would have recovered from the poisoning. So the defense brought in a parade of doctors to discredit the autopsy report and the doctor's opinion about the cause of death. And they also brought in a parade of witnesses to try and sully Madge's good name and paint her as a slut and a drunk rather than this squeaky clean good girl next door kind of thing. On November 14th, 1925, Clink and Gentry were acquitted, but a jury found Stevenson guilty of murder in the second degree. Prosecutors asked for the death penalty and told the jury that they were looking at a hideous monster and a serpent who should be put away for the protection of the daughters of the future. Two days later, he was sentenced to 20 years. Okay. Stevenson was shook. I bet. He's just like, wait, wait, 
but consequences I'm, what I'm this guilty? is cancel culture i I'm, don't <laughs> yeah i'm guilty of the thing that i did are you kidding me is, what I, kind of world do i live in do you know who i am yeah i'm a straight white man right and this i have was, money it's clearly an antifa yes that did this <laughs> do your own research he couldn't believe that governor jackson had not come through with this pardon but he was still sure that his sentence would be commuted once he got to prison Wow. The governor was wow, just waiting the until. Delusion. Yeah. After all, he, he had gotten this governor elected along with countless yeah. other lawmakers in the state of Indiana. But over a year passed with him sitting in a jail cell and nobody was fucking with him. Wow. So eventually he did start to lose hope. People on Reddit are just like, just wait for it. It's yeah, coming. It's coming. It's coming. Just it's read fine. the signs. Yes. It's coming. <laughs> no. Next month. There's no, Q actually, drops about it. Yes. yes. <laughs> Steven so will be released. He will be. And, and you know, her emails, it, it's all <laughs> yes, in there. Yes. <laughs> so eventually he lost hope, but instead started focusing his attention on revenge. Oh, wow. What a productive use of mm-hmm, your time. Mm-hmm. In an interview. Revenge on who, though? These lawmakers who'd never came to his aid. In 1927, he gave an interview with the Indianapolis Times. And in it, he gave a list of all the officials and political leaders who had accepted bribes and payments you from the You mean the, the failing Klan. Indiana Times. Yes. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's call it by its true name. <laughs> I, I think they have since failed. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay. okay. Well. Yes. But they actually won a Pulitzer for this reporting. Oh, because, wow. cool. like, it was a huge deal. Wow. Literally, he gave a list of every politician and every political leader who accepted bribes from the KKK. Good, good. And he had all the receipts. He kept very wow. diligent notes and had all of it and gave it all to the papers. Wow. This led to a wave of indictments across the state. But was was that his intention to just like blow up the shit? He was. I mean, he was just He salty. kept all that stuff because he wanted to have... He just wanted to to like make sure that he had something over people, yeah. So oh, that he could okay. use it for use it. When yeah, he needed. He to. didn't know what he was going to need it for, but he knew he would need it at some point. So the head of the Republican Party in Marion County was indicted along with Governor Jackson himself, and it was like Good. a shockwave. It just led to even more scandals that were radiating out across the nation, and all of this negative publicity officially ended the second wave of the KKK. Like this, that was it. Within a year of the trial, Klan membership was already down by half in the state of Indiana and had dropped by millions nationwide. But after Stevenson spilled all this tea to the press, the Indiana Klan, which was once the strongest in the country, pretty much collapsed. They had as many as half a million members in 1925, by 1928, 4,000 members left. Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Within a three-year span. Shit. Half wow. a million people just like, nope, we're done. Because in their minds, again, they're these moral, law-abiding, good people. Yeah. And they're like, we can't be associated with this. Yeah. I just want to hate black people. What's yeah. wrong with that? I don't know uh, this old... OG, like, Takashi 6 9 yeah. fellow over here telling all the secrets. Yeah. I'm doing the Lord's work. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Hating the Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's okay. Yeah. That's significant. Right? Yeah. I mean, such a fucked up story. Yeah. But, wow. So, yeah, that's pretty much the <sighs> bulk of the story of, of D.C. Stevenson and the second wave of the KKK. He was paroled in 1950. For what reason? Well, his sentence was going to be up. His sentence was up by then in 1950. He went to prison in 1925. So he was done. That's garbage. Yeah. But whatever, I guess. But then he violated his parole Good. eight months later and was sent back for another 10 years. Fantastic. He was I love discharged. It. I love that for him. Yes. <laughs> he was discharged six years later in 1956 on the condition that he leave Indiana and never return. Ha <laughs> ha. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> Go away. We wow. don't even want to look at you anymore. But unfortunately, over the next 10 years, he married, mistreated, and abandoned Jesus. another two wives. And at the age of 70... He was arrested for attempting to molest a 16-year-old girl in Missouri. Like, did you learn nothing what? from any of this, you piece of fucking a garbage? Child? 16 years old, when he was 70. Thankfully, this literal garbage person 
finally died of a heart attack in 1966. What a blessing. It's like you're still trying to be a rapist when you're like old and rickety. And have been to prison for half of your life. Yeah. What is wrong with you, sir? Wow. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> I that was a a wild story. Right? How is there not a movie about I this? I know. It is Truly. unbelievable. Yeah. It's so fucked up, so sensational. It al- happened all so quickly, too. Yeah. Just Yeah, he met her in January. By March she was dead. Or well, on her deathbed by March. She died in April. And then he like single-handedly like <laughs> took down the clan just like yeah. as a salty bitch yeah not because he didn't like the clan no but... he loved the clan. <laughs> yeah. like he lived his life for for their i don't know their way of life but he was just mad yeah you didn't pardon me yeah so fuck all y'all like i thought we were all just in this like doing crime and hurting people <laughs> i feel betrayed wait i wasn't supposed to get drunk and bite women wait the whole time <laughs> the whole the time, whole time? <laughs> stop it well no one told me i mean <laughs> It's not my fault. I didn't know. Huh. Oh, my God. That reminds me. Yeah, that's like my scandal that's coming up. Oh, shit. It's like, okay. But I didn't know. How could I be guilty? <laughs> yeah. Nobody told me this was illegal. I can't terrorize, rape, and like bite women, lie about it, and then like rat on all my friends. Like, It, it was my car. I mean, Hiram Evans. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's I forgot that he was trying to blame Hiram. Wow. Wow. What a guy. What a guy. Uh, to flushing turds. To flushing turds. Our drinks are, are almost empty. <laughs> we're we're getting there. We're doing we're putting in the work to mm-hmm. drink these cocktails that are delicious. America's history is juicy. We just add gin and Fancy, what's it called? Chartreuse? Chartreuse. Green chartreuse. Ooh, green chartreuse. There is also yellow chartreuse, which is different. Oh. Yeah. We add some cherry liqueur and we're, you know, we're having a a fine and dandy time. And Madge is having the last word. Yes. Mm-hmm. She is. What was her, her real name? Her, like, they called her Madge? I, it's just everything that I saw oh, said Madge. Madge. Yeah. Okay, maybe Margaret. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or just Madge. It yeah. could just be Madge, yeah. Yeah. Because I, ne- I never saw any mention of Margaret. Oh, once, okay. So, so her name is Madge. Yeah. Cool. I love that. Madge Olberholzer. Yeah, she had the last word, which, oh, God, still, though, it's so fucked up. It didn't stop him from trying to rape a 16-year-old girl at the age of 70. But he would have done so much so worse. So much worse if he had, had he not been, been locked up. Exactly. Yeah. God, yeah. Anyways, thank you so much <laughs> for listening to Beyond Approach. This has been Stephanie Domingo. And Tux Lurzel. <laughs> Thank you to Tim Clough, our editor, our sound engineer, our podfather, our biggest cheerleader. Yes. We could not do this without him. Facts are facts, America. Yeah, facts are facts, America. All right, bye. Bye. (laughs) Spooky Halloween. I mean, bye. Beyond Reproach is proudly recorded in Bushwick, Brooklyn, on land belonging to the Lenape Nation. Please note that we are not historians, we're just a couple of drunks who never shut up and love history. A full list of all source information can be found in the show notes on our website. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. And remember that written reviews are especially important. If you like us, please do one of two things. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, or send this episode to a friend, family member, or someone who you think would be into it. Don't forget to follow us on social media and make sure you follow us on Instagram because we post our cocktail recipes the Thursday before each full episode. Please drink along with us if you are not driving. We also have a shop at beyondreproachpod.com. Get your merch, brand yourselves, and we have exclusive content on Patreon where you can directly support the production of our show.